Everyone needs to relax. The most convenient is always movies and shows which you watch with friends and family. Next time over dinner, when you're discussing your favorite shows and then move on to compare different services, you're going to have some solid points to talk about. You're going to have a whole new understanding on how the media industry is changing, both from a viewer's perspective and a business standpoint. I'm going to share with you how I see the entire media space, specifically the major subscription businesses. I have a very different way of looking at the streaming wars. For me, it's really not as simple as uh, content is king. Oops. There are so many more nuances to be thinking about. So I'll start by talking about streaming as it is today. There are a bunch of regional players, startups, and traditional media companies all around the globe. We are just going to focus on the major ones in this video. We'll break down their different strategies, what services are coming this year, and finally, the top trends to watch out for 2020 and beyond. Let's get started. Netflix is over 20 years old. They started by mailing DVDs straight to your home. The DVD subscription service was really revolutionary. When I see that new red envelope in the mail, it brings a sense of joy inside. And right around the time they ship their billionth DVD, the company reinvents itself. They start streaming movies and shows online. And today, they have the most subscribers. Nearly 160 million subscribers globally. How did they get there and will they continue to grow? Let me give you five areas in which Netflix is radically different from the rest. Diverse content. Remember the first time you signed up for Netflix. You get to your homepage and all you see are their originals. But over 60% of what we watch on Netflix are not their originals. They're movies and shows Netflix doesn't own but license from others for a certain time. Which is why we keep seeing articles like what's coming and leaving Netflix this month. The most watched show on Netflix was The Office, which left last year along with friends. Apart from those two, the catalog itself is becoming smaller. Netflix started streaming online in 2007, but only in 2013 they start making their own content starting with House of Cards. The more successful we were at building an on-demand uh, subscriber base with content, the more likely they were going to be to stop licensing to us, right? It's actually one of the reasons why we started original content in the first place. Now they have a really wide range of movies and shows across different genres. They're even innovating with different lengths of episodes on series. Anywhere from 15 minute episodes to like one hour and the network TV guys, they're still constrained with their you know, specific episode windows. And they're even testing interactive experiences in which you as a user make choices on behalf of characters on screen. And you end up with a variety of different plot twists and ending. So you and I could see the same movie and have a completely different experience and interpretation. Bandersnatch. Bander what? Bandersnatch. Bandersnatch is a unique Black Mirror story in that it's interactive. Till now, there's been a limited focus on movies, but even that is changing with the recent release of movies like The Irishman. They don't know I know. While you have been listening to me talk, the Netflix service has gone live in nearly every country of the world but China, where we hope to also be in the future. There are really three buckets of content that Netflix is creating. One is to keep people around, two is to acquire new people in existing markets, and three is to launch in completely new markets. Netflix is a truly global company. They make content in 17 different regions. And keep in mind, people all over the world watch this content. Apart from the content itself, they gradually added extensive support for more languages, not just in their interface, but like subtitles and dubbing. From a growth standpoint, six of the seven new subscribers they add every single quarter come from outside the US. You can't talk about Netflix without talking about their recommendation system, how personal it feels for each one of us. It's not perfect, but far better than other services. That's because they invest heavily in technology. Netflix has been spending billions in just technology year over year. From day one, Netflix has had a direct-to-consumer relationship. 
So Netflix knows every single one of their users, who they are, what they watch, enough data to predict what you're most likely to watch every evening. I have like, you know, um, uh, emotional sort of like a human attachment to Netflix. Next, Netflix has incredible brand value. You look at the global ranking for brands, Netflix is the only streaming service here. An entire season of a show airs on Lifetime, it does decently well, Netflix comes along, slaps its brand on it and releases it, becomes one of the most viewed shows ever. Every relationship has its obstacles to overcome, right? Look at the level of influence they've had. Ever heard Prime and Chill? It's only Netflix and Chill. And a bunch of new services are marketing off Netflix's popularity. They not only pioneered streaming as it is today, but also binge watching, releasing all episodes at once. How's Netflix able to invest so much in content, marketing, and technology? It's access to capital. They've been a public company for a long time with only one major revenue stream, subscription fees. So it's very clear cut story from an investor's point of view. The leadership is excellent playing the expectations game. It sets the rules of the game, controls the narrative instead of equity analysts. They have convinced investors that the only metric to be looking at is subscriber growth. And you make sense of those numbers along with content costs and revenues. Content costs are growing slower than revenue, so that's great, but it's gonna take discipline to keep it this way. In short, they spend on content, attract subscribers, push the market cap up, spend more on content, and we'll have to see if they can maintain the cycle. There was a time CEO Reed Hastings used to say, we are only competing with sleep. Let's move on to what's being positioned as Netflix's largest threat. Hello. Disney. Disney has been around for nearly a century. It's an extremely emotional brand for multiple generations. They have finally entered the streaming space with Disney+. Plus. I'll share with you three reasons why this service is here to stay, even though they're so late in the game. Evergreen content. Disney Plus has a very unique model. No licensing anything, they own all their content. They can continue to release those high budget movies in cinemas, cover all the costs there in the box office, and still have it on their platform. Over the years, they've acquired major studios. They're gonna be offering Marvel titles along with all Pixar movies. Apart from all this family content, they produce a bunch of rated content for Hulu, their majority stakeholder. They also have a stronghold in sports with ESPN. And in fact, you can subscribe to Hulu, ESPN, and Disney Plus as a single bundle. Biggest question here is, can they continue to produce rich content and not just rely on the classics? One way they're broadening the kind of content they house is through Fox acquisition. It wasn't done just to own more TV channels, it was made specifically with Disney Plus in mind. Moving on, infrastructure. How many of you remember going for Endgame? The cinema websites crashing all around the world with that kind of traffic. And you have Disney Plus with a ton of HD and 4K video 10 million people subscribe to it on launch day and nothing happens. So very robust platform. Disney has been steadily acquiring stakes in BAMTEC, the company that powers millions of streams at once for ESPN and now Disney+. Plus. You're really gonna miss what sets Disney Plus apart if you think it's gonna remain just a video on demand service. Over 150 million people in 2019 visited a Disney brand. These are places where families and friends really build a strong connect with the brand itself. They have a massive merchandising business, basically selling the rights to make products, these toys that we see. Last year, merchandising itself brought in more revenue for them than their entire TV revenue. And you have major cinema releases. Disney captured most of 2019's box office. They're still able to create buzz around their upcoming movies because they spend aggressively on marketing. They've got posters all around, trailers playing in major cities. So you got theme parks, merchandise, and cinemas. Expect to see Disney very soon leverage the Disney Plus platform to promote all this, to create some sort of a unified experience. Next, Apple. Apple has generally stayed ahead with major changes in the media space distribution-wise, starting with the iTunes Store and then Apple Music. 
The latest, of course, is Apple TV+. Plus. A new service unlike anything that's been done before. Let me give you four reasons why Apple is in a unique position to compete in streaming. Quality content. All of Apple's productions involve A-list stars, extremely high budgets. They might start with a limited library, but they plan to add new titles every single month. Apple is committed to spending $6 billion in content, which is not a lot if they're going to stick to productions with only the best of Hollywood. We don't see them doing anything in the realm of Netflix or HBO's dark and introspective series kind. Apple's focus will remain mainstream, family-friendly content. Apple's got cash. They have enough of it to buy Netflix. See, Apple used to make half their profits from one device, the iPhone. And newer iPhones, they seem just incrementally better. We don't seem to be upgrading every single year. So sales are low, and they're making a conscious shift to expand their recurring revenue business. So even with Apple TV+, Plus, they're playing the long game. They can afford to undercut others, giving away one year worth of subscription free with every new device you buy. Apple also acquires a lot of scaled companies like Beeps and Shazam. So we may see them going after studios and production houses as part of expanding their Apple TV Plus catalog sometime soon. Integration. Apple has always prided itself on the fact that it creates both the software and the hardware. And so it's seamlessly integrated and made for each other. They really have complete control over the ecosystem. Well, before Apple TV Plus was out there, Apple created the TV app for iOS and Apple TV, trying to integrate at least the discovery of content from multiple services. They weren't able to include the most important services like Netflix, but a lot of the smaller players came on board. We could see the TV app getting more personalized and relevant, which gives Apple more control over the interface. Apple also has the home pod, which if people use the voice commands on it often, can also be leveraged to promote Apple TV content. To give you an idea of what this means, think about Alexa. Getting the grand tour from Prime Video. When Amazon finds out that a lot of people use Alexa to buy a certain kind of product, like a battery, they quickly come on board and produce their own batteries under the Amazon Basics brand. We could see HomePod supporting more voice commands related to streaming video, but with a deeper level of integration into Apple TV+, especially while trying to find something to watch. Apple is primarily a consumer technology company with a strong brand. And one of the main ways they portray themselves as premium is through their retail stores. At the heart of major cities around the world, Apple has these incredible temples where they not just sell products, but organize community events, hold workshops, and host experts. Apple may well leverage its chain of stores to promote TV content. By playing their trailers, say on massive screens at pretty much no cost, they could even add a whole new layer to experiencing their content like AR and VR. People increasingly seek lively experiences as a way of disconnecting from the online world. Apple can even have interactive events with celebrities starring in their movies and shows. Prime. Amazon has actually been in the media space for quite a while now. They had a service, Amazon Unbox, in 2006. You could like download individual movies and shows and pay for each one of them. Then later they switched to a video on demand model and in 2011, they bundled it with Prime. Amazon starts producing through Amazon Studios starting 2013. Prime has over 100 million subscribers. Keep in mind though, it's not just a streaming service. Prime comes with a bunch of other advantages, but Prime Video ranks up there with free two-day shipping in terms of what drives people to subscribe. They've made some great shows and will continue to spend on content. They got AWS servers around the world to take care of its distribution. Just like Netflix, Amazon is going global. The kind of content they make, they're growing exponentially in India, where even Netflix is playing catch-up. Hulu started off as a joint venture between Fox and NBC. Initially, it was just to aggregate episodes that would air on linear TV and then make them accessible online. By 2018, 
Disney, Fox, and Time Warner all have stakes in Hulu, and they have over 20 million subscribers, almost all of which are in the US. Hulu offers multiple tiers, one with ads and one without, and there's also a live TV package, which is like a fraction of cable pricing. And we should see their library expand with even more it shows. Remember I mentioned multiple giants got a piece of Hulu? After the Disney Fox acquisition, Disney gets a controlling stake. And on top of that, AT&T Time Warner sells back its 10%, and Comcast has agreed to sell its stake to Disney by 2024. So this is going to be a major asset for Disney. HBO stands for Home Box Office. Since the 70s, they've been creating incredible shows with really complex storylines. Their channels have a global reach, over 100 million subscribers through cable and now their own streaming services. HBO Go and HBO Now. They've always been positioned as a premium service, especially with the pricing. HBO hasn't relied much on advertising revenue, so they really have complete control over the kind of content they make without worrying about what advertisers think. We'll continue to see more dark and graphic content on their shows. Here you're getting a great library of well-made shows, consistent Emmy winners, and series like Game of Thrones. And there's a new series, which by the way, won a ton of awards at the Golden Globes, and is my personal favorite, Succession. Check it out. Now I'm gonna talk a little about the streaming services coming out 2020, the confirmed ones. Let's take a peek. After the AT&T Time Warner acquisition, they've announced Max will have the entire HBO library plus a bunch of other assets owned by Warner Media. So now they can leverage on all the existing AT&T subscribers to market this new service. And friends will be there. HBO Max is coming this May. The way I look at it, HBO does already have global subscribers, but all the shows are not ultra local ones. They're all American themed shows which happen to have a global audience. So this trend would mostly continue. I believe this will be the most important service to look out for in 2020. This next service is hands down the most unique we're gonna see this year. Before I get into it, let's look at the most downloaded apps. Short form video is really picking up. YouTube has a ton of it, Instagram now with IGTV, and the biggest hit has been TikTok. All streaming services today make HD content for TVs, but of course you see them on your laptops and phones, but it's still for widescreen. Less than 10% of streaming happens on phones. Quibi is going to be the first to make content specifically for phones. Well, I think we're actually offering way more than just new content. We are trying to bring together the best of Silicon Valley and Hollywood in a way that has not been done before. And we're trying to create a whole new form of content that is designed exclusively for mobile. So what's this new startup? Who's backing it up? Well, Disney, Universal, Warner Media together have invested over a billion in Quibi. Quick bite. They have enough funding to create content aggressively till about mid-2021. But not just any kind of content. They're creating cinema-grade content as 10 to 15-minute quibbies. Yeah, they don't call it episodes. I think it stands for quiet bingo. That's like when you play bingo, but they don't tell you the letters or numbers, so you just mark it how you want. How to storytell on a small screen. It's content meant to be consumed on the go. So they're starting with zero legacy content, but users are gonna have three hours of new original content every single day once it launches. As part of Quibi's deal with creators, the content is not owned forever by Quibi. They license it to themselves for seven years, which is why they could you know, attract the best of the best in Hollywood. Episodes that are seven to 10 minutes in length. And they feature many of Hollywood's biggest names, both in front of and behind the camera. And then you have ads. Even the way Quibi does ads is going to be really innovative. Again, they'll be made specifically for the mobile format, but also ads that kind of build on each other, like a story. In fact, when you switch between portrait and landscape, you see different views. Walmart, Pepsi, Google, and other major brands are coming on board committed to spending $150 million in ad spend. They've partnered with T-Mobile to promote this, so their existing customers may get a better deal. 
For everyone else, about $5 with ads and eight without. Keep an eye out for Quibi. It's launching in April. And one more in April, Peacock. It's NBC Universal's offering owned by Comcast. Peacock will offer a lot of classic content. They'd be giving popular ones like Battlestar Galactica, New Life, with something like a sequel. The Office will be here. You're kidding me, God! Along with Arts and Recreation. And that's TV. As for movies, all the Universal movies would be there. One of my all-time favorites is Casino. And of course, a bunch of originals would be announced too. Similar to Disney, Peacock has the potential to integrate with theme parks. So all in all, Peacock is going to start with a massive collection. I'd say they have to be careful about pricing. If not, the cable business itself will be undercut too early. Scripted series, scripted movies. Great companies going to be fighting over that market share. Our strategy is, let's step to the side of that. Next, a service with a very specific kind of TV. One that we all like, but not every single day. Services from Discovery. They are partnering with BBC on this. They have produced together in the past on titles like Life and Planet Earth. Discovery also owns 19 live TV channels like Food Network and Animal Planet, and online properties like Now This and Motor Trend. It's supposed to be less than $5 a month, but even at that price point with really high quality content, I see this as a challenge to market because it is still a very narrow selection and they would be much better off licensing to the piggies. At least that's what I think, unless the experience here turns out to be something really different. And now for the bonus. I'm adding this one as a bonus because there's nothing really officially announced, but the company is enormous in scale and reach. And if they decide to step into the game, it could be quite a player in streaming. Two billion people use it every month, YouTube. They did experiment with YouTube Red Originals as a subscription service a few years ago. Right now, they still have YouTube TV as a subscription for live channels, but very limited exclusive content. They rely solely on ads for revenue. And if people are using more Facebook video or IGTV or TikTok, time spent on YouTube would go down. So even if it's not original content, we could see YouTube offer some different subscription packages for quality content very soon. So by now, I'm sure you clearly see what separates these different streaming services. We covered not just how different the content is, but also how they go about getting our attention in very different ways in terms of positioning and marketing. The media industry is shifting. The relationship media companies have with us is changing. The beauty of the direct-to-consumer model is that the customer and consumer are the same. Over the next five years, we're gonna see more independent services and also much more licensing of others content. Bids are gonna go up, people in the creative space are really gonna benefit, and viewers have so much choice now, it's incredible. Today on average, there are three subscription services per household that streams. Is it really a zero-sum game? Is it a streaming war? Real business wars are very different. There's coffee wars, Starbucks, McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts. They're selling almost identical product with thick margins and try to retain customers through membership and reward programs. Think of this not as a streaming war. It's very likely we're gonna have more than a single victor. Add to that the notion that streaming intrinsically must be cheaper than cable. We might have started streaming for that reason, but it, it doesn't have to stay that way. The number of rides we take on Uber are thrice as many taxi rides as we used to take. So your Uber bill could very well be more than what you were paying in taxi fares, but that seems to be okay. The only difference with streaming is our time is limited. These services are all competing for our time. I have only 24 hours and Bill Gates has over a thousand minutes a day. How the viewing hours are gonna be shared among these services would be the most important factor in which ones dominate. Linear TV, no offense to what we're doing right here, is in trouble. This whole idea of streaming wars, I believe, is a great expression that's been created by the media. You have a, a different consumer today. People aren't going to just buy content for content's sake. They're going to buy content because it's associated with other products and services. They are all going to be in some fashion, shape, or form. It's not clear what that is yet, but they're all going to come out of this with some win. Storytelling is infinite. If I tell a good story, it doesn't make your story bad. People will subscribe to a couple services the way that they subscribe to a couple news services. Do they end up watching uh, what mix of all the services? There is a general direction all these services are headed. Let me share with you 10 major trends in video subscription. The way I look at it, it's gonna be very normal for us to have 
three to five different subscriptions at the same time. Even when Disney Plus launched, 80% of their subscribers also had Netflix. Each service will get more focused on a certain kind of content and eventually will need a mix of a few, access. It's gonna become easier to try out and subscribe to new services as they're released. Apparently, a third of Disney Plus subscribers are actually taking advantage of their deal with Verizon, where some users get up to a year free. We see every major service coming out this year from Quibi to HBO Max have tie-ups with carriers so it's easier to onboard new users. We're also seeing real deep integration between streaming services and TVs. Some of them have their apps pre-installed and Netflix and Prime even have dedicated buttons on LG Smart TV remotes. More consolidation. If a deal at the scale of Disney and Fox could happen, there are many more to come. It's going to be great for users because every service would eventually have more variety to offer. One of the things I did want to talk to you about is the international market, because that's where you think the growth is going to come. That's not one market, but yes. But <laughs> yeah. International expansion. More of it for Netflix, much more for others. Three years ago, Netflix tried to partner with a Baidu-owned streaming service. But the partnership itself didn't last long. They claimed their system to verify users weren't secure. They may give this a second shot. Eventually, we have much more standardized libraries of movies and shows across countries. Cable stays. Two reasons why. News and sports. Live news and live sports. Even if cable dies sooner, it's not going to be because all the sports channels go direct to consumer with their own platform. It could be because Facebook Live outbids the rest and gets streaming rights. But until then, cable serves a purpose. I'll binge it or I'll watch five series this month and then I'll switch it off and I'll go over to HBO Max and I'll switch that off two months later and I'll go to the next place. More churn. Churn rates show how many new subscribers leave after the trial period. As more services come out, people might want to just give them a shot while it's free. Netflix's churn rate at the lowest is about 8%. This may go up for the streaming space across the board. Contracts. Locking users in through contracts. Or at least offering discounts if you subscribe for a year instead of a month. We saw how WeWork filled the news when they had cash flow problems because customers wanted to get a desk with like a one month commitment while WeWork had debt burdens on the building lease for 15 years. So streaming companies may need to be forced to get users to commit long term, just like how cable companies were doing. We don't love it when Apple comes between you and the things you love to listen to. Subscription tax. Apple has been doing this. When new users sign up for any subscription service through an iOS app, Apple gets 15% of the monthly fee. Netflix is one of the few companies that bypass this. So new users can't sign up through their app. They're forced to go to the website, enter their card details there, and then come back to the app and use Netflix. Would Google implement something like this on their Android apps, or will TV companies also demand a piece of the action? We'll see. Sharing accounts. Just in 2019, an estimated 9.1 billion was lost in password sharing between friends, relatives, and even illegal sales. Streaming companies could choose to crack down on this, but they fear it could promote something even worse. This brings me on to my last point. Piracy, VPN, mad blocking. Nowadays, it's really easy to torrent entire seasons of shows and watch them on your desktop or TV. Many broadband providers and even governments have tried to stop people from torrenting, but you have a lot of options. You could just use a proxy server or subscribe to a VPN. And finally, you have ad blockers. It is so easy to use ad blockers. 40% of millennials know how to, 20% of Gen X's. Even the largest streamer, YouTube, hasn't found a way to permanently ban it. So pretty much every ad support service will be prone to it. I hope you now have a much more holistic view of the media industry, specifically subscription businesses. Whether you're a Netflix buff, an Apple fan, or someone in the media-related business, I'm curious to know what you think. Thank you for watching.